It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Speaker. Speaker, this question is for the Premier. Today, the Munia, Spoleski, and Osberg families are here with us. They're here because they have been left without credible investigations into the deaths of their loved ones by the Thunder Bay Police Services. Ontario and the Thunder Bay Police Administration have failed these families again and again and again. And despite studies and reviews, inquests, documentaries, panels, podcasts, far too many promises, people have not seen change. So my question to the Premier is, what does this government have to say to these families who are here today looking for accountability into the deaths of their loved ones? To reply for the government, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any loss of a family member is a tragedy. The loss to a family is absolutely something that we can't measure. And Mr. Speaker, we take this very seriously. We've listened carefully to the survivors. We've listened to the Indigenous leaders. We've listened to community organizations. And the loved ones of the families themselves have participated in the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Mr. Speaker, any loss is one too many. We will always do everything we can to support them and to keep Ontario safe. Supplementary, the member for Kiwetanong. Um, nothing has changed for First Nations people that live in Thunder Bay. Speaker, uh, there is an ongoing failure to investigate the deaths of First Nations people in Thunder Bay. The Ontario government has let Thunder Bay Police Service become a cold case factory for Indigenous deaths. Speaker, uh, there are now more than 20 cold cases due to incompetent death investigations. Why has Ontario, why hasn't Ontario put resources into making sure these investigations don't become cold cases? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, any loss of a family member is a tragedy, and the loss to those families are completely immeasurable. And we understand this. But, Mr. Speaker, there's a new chief and there's a new police service board in Thunder Bay with good intentions to keep their communities safe. We have to give the new police service board and command leadership an opportunity to work with all community stakeholders so that members of the community feel served and protected. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to take the concerns of Indigenous communities very seriously. And the final supplementary back to the member for Kiwetanong. Speaker, you cannot simply change the driver of the machine that is not working. Right. Speaker, uh, the Monias Beleski Osberg families need support to get the investigations out of the hands of the Thunder Bay Police Service and into the hands of a service who can do a credible investigation. The families are calling for a complete reform of the Thunder Bay Police Service after multiple instances of corruption have rendered the existing force unfixable. Today, uh, I, will, I spent some time with the families and the leaders in the North. Families and the leaders are asking again Question. to disband the Thunder Bay Police Service. When will Ontario do this? The Solicitor, the Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And again, I'll repeat it again. Our thoughts are always with the families who lost loved ones on this immeasurable loss. But, Mr. Speaker, 140,000 people, 140,000 people in Thunder Bay 
have a right, have an equal right, just as we do here in southern Ontario, to feel safe in their own communities. Mr. Speaker, I have seen the frontline officers that work hard with passion and commitment. These are people that love their community. Mr. Speaker, and I'll repeat it again, there is a new police service board. There is a new chief with good intentions to serve their community and to make sure that everyone has that right of accountability in their communities to feel safe. Mr. Speaker, I will continue to do Response. whatever I can to make sure our message of public safety is upheld all across Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. This weekend, I was in Wilmot speaking to farmers, and they are mad. Back in March, they were told that the region of Waterloo plans to purchase 770 acres of their land. If they refuse, they've been told their land will be expropriated without their consent. Farmers are given the choice of no choice. They've asked me to come to the House and ask the government directly. Will the Premier provide some answers for the people of Wilmot today about why they are losing their land and not being given a choice about their livelihood? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, the members opposite have opposed economic development in our province at virtually every opportunity they get. We have tens of billions of prospects, new job-creating investments in our pipeline. In fact, we now have more prospects than we have land readily available, and that is why the Premier put out a call. He put out a call to municipalities all across the province to get shovel-ready sites assembled so these companies can set up shop and create those good-paying jobs in their own communities. Speakers, we are, speaker, we are decades behind our biggest competitor south of the border when it comes to having shovel-ready sites. And for that reason, we have now a dedicated team at our ministry and at Invest Response. Ontario who are vetting lands sent by our municipal partners. Companies from across the globe know there's no better place to do business than right here in Ontario. And the supplementary question. Well, you, speaker, farmers are workers and farms are businesses too. That's right. And actually, it's an extraordinarily important uh, part of our economy. When I went to Wilmot on Friday, I got to tell you, Speaker, we were expecting about 100 people to show up uh, at the community town hall. Over 400 people came to raise their voices. Uh, and here's what I heard from them. I heard they're feeling left behind. They're, they feel like they've been taken for granted by this government, undervalued, sidelined, and they know that something doesn't smell right here, and it isn't just the manure. Everyone is worried that it can happen to farmers in Wilmot and farmers on the Greenbelt. If it can happen there, then it can happen to them too. So my question to the Premier is, we've seen this government hide information question. from Ontarians with the Greenbelt grab. What are they trying to hide from farmers this time? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, let's look south of the 401 at what happened in St. Thomas. 1,500 acres of land was assembled with no expropriation. That allowed Volkswagen to announce their Gigafactory, 3,000 direct jobs, 30,000 indirect jobs. They're already hiring today. To do so, to help facilitate that, we introduced Bill 63 Order. to change the borders of Central Elgin and St. Thomas. Speaker, that bill was supported by the members opposite to help assemble that land. The last thing we're going to do is to now listen to the NDP and Liberals whose high tax policies saw business and workers flee our province in droves. 300,000 manufacturing and working and other workers left our province under the under the Liberals speaker we are creating the conditions for job growth in every industry and in every region the members for Hamilton Mountain and the member for Waterloo will please come to order supplementary mind the minister that the farming sector contributes 48 billion dollars to our economy Earlier this month, 
the Premier confirmed it was him who gave the directive to expropriate Wilmot farmland, but he provided no further information about what's going to happen to the property or the farmers. More than 30,000 people have signed the petition to stop the expropriation of Wilmot farmland. Let me tell you, they are sick of this government's lack of transparency. The Federation of Agriculture agrees there must be more transparency, more fairness for these farmers. Maybe the next answer to this question could come from the Premier who is sitting right here and they could actually mention farmers for a change. Is the Premier ignoring farmers so he could make another backroom deal with developers to carve up our farmland? Members, so please take those seats. The member for Brampton North will come to order. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, in order for all of these communities in Ontario to get in on the pipeline of tens of billions of dollars, the, pe the Premier's instructions to municipalities were get your shovel ready sites assembled. Look at what happened in St. Thomas. 1,500 acres, no expropriation. Let's go down to Windsor, Speaker, and look at the Next Star plant. Here we have a community of Windsor that assembled their land. 2,500 direct jobs, tens of thousands of indirect jobs, all happening in the Windsor area. We've already been back down in Windsor twice now to announce other companies who are part of that next star. DS, Bobeck, these are companies who are now hiring hundreds and thousands of people because they assembled their land in Windsor because they assembled their lands in Volkswagen, at Volkswagen in St. Thomas with no expropriation, Speaker. This is what's happening. This is what's happening all across of Ontario. We have tens of billions of dollars of investment that want to come here to create jobs. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the committee reviewing Bill 166 has heard repeated concerns about the alarming overreach of the bill in empowering the minister to unilaterally dictate the contents of post-secondary policies on student mental health and racism and hate on campus. So it was quite a relief last week to hear the Premier say that he agreed Bill 166 went too far because universities are legislated to govern themselves. Unfortunately, the Premier issued a statement a few hours later announcing his support for the bill after all. Speaker, can the Premier tell us what happened to make him change his mind? To reply, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. And I want to thank all members of this House for unanimously passing second reading of Bill 166. Thank you. We assume we all agree on ensuring that students are safe on campus, and we stand committed to ensuring that students are safe and supported on campuses across Ontario, free from intimidation, from discrimination. And, Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, we have seen horrific instances of hate on campuses across Ontario, which is why our government is taking the necessary steps to support students and their education from the time they walk on a campus till the time they graduate, which means delivering a safe, and supportive environment that is conducive to learning. It is my expectation that schools step up for students, and when it comes to the safety and well-being of students, providing anything but the best falls short. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. We're going to try to fix the bill tomorrow, but I can tell the minister that it's not lack of policy, it's lack of resources that is leaving post-secondary students without support. Speaker, not only does Bill 166 permit unprecedented political interference in the autonomy of universities, putting the government in conflict with each of Ontario's universities' acts, but it could also conflict with the Ontario Human Rights Code. This government already lost in court once over its attempt to use ministerial directives to dictate university policies on student fees. Instead of spending public dollars on a lost cause court challenge, why won't this government invest in the mental health and anti-racism support that post-secondary students need? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we are committed to fighting hate on campuses. We have many young people in our crowd here today, but we are committed to ensuring that campuses in Ontario are safe and free from discrimination and intimidation. 
All students in this province deserve a right to a safe learning environment. I'd like to thank, I read a quote from Michael Levin, Levitt, the uh, president and CEO from Friends of Simon Wiesenthal. Given the surge in hatred and discriminatory behaviour on campus in recent months, particularly against Jewish students and faculty, it's essential all colleges in Ontario and universities have specific policies in place to combat all forms of bigotry. We welcome the Strengthening Accountability and Student Supports Act and applaud this timely action by the Ontario government. Mm -hmm. I want to thank all members for unanimously passing second reading, and I would appreciate your support on third reading and ensuring that students in this province have a safe learning environment, which they have the right to. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And I have a question for the Minister of Energy. Families in Ontario and in Niagara West are struggling to keep up with the soaring costs for essentials like fuel, food, and eating directly linked to the 23 per cent increase in the carbon tax that came into effect under the Liberal government from Ottawa. And we know that when I go door, knock, go door knocking in Niagara West, I hear from these families, these hardworking families and job creators in my riding about the increased costs directly linked to the carbon tax. And I know that the Liberal and NDP members in this chamber, when they knock doors in their communities, hear the exact same stories from people who are having to choose about the essentials because of the cost that's driven by the federal Liberal carbon tax. To this date, though, we see that the other parties in this chamber refuse to join our government in condemning the Trudeau Liberal carbon tax increases, which is shameful when we look at the hardworking families of our province. So I'm wondering, could this minister tell this House why it's so important that we scrap the carbon tax and put more money back in the pockets of the hardworking Ontarians? Minister of Energy. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the great member from uh, Niagara for the question this morning on the federal carbon tax, supported by Ontario's Liberal leader, the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, which is driving up the price of everything. We know very well because we've been talking about it for months, Mr. Speaker. And you know, We have a plan here in Ontario. Just last week, uh, it's part of our Powering Ontario's Growth Plan, I was down in Niagara Falls, uh, the member's own riding at the Surratt and Beck facility, where we announced the refurbishment of 1.7 gigawatts of hydroelectric power at the Niagara facilities, Mr. Speaker. Just this morning, I was at a great conference down at the Sheraton where they're having the First Nations major project uh, conference. It was a huge uh, conference where um, First Nations from right across the province are powering Ontario's growth by partnering with us on our power projects, Response. like battery storage projects and other non-emitting generators, Mr. Speaker. We're proving that you don't need a punitive carbon tax. It's time to scrap that tax, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And my thanks to the Minister for his response. Speaker, it's undeniable that the Liberal carbon tax is having a negative impact on so many lives here in the province of Ontario, making life more and more unaffordable across this nation. In fact, we've heard both the Parliamentary Budget Officer and the Governor of the Bank of Canada say that the carbon tax is inflationary. We know that the people of Ontario uh, are struggling because of the Liberal tax increases from the federal government, and we know that no one should be forced to make gut-wrenching decisions about whether to put food on the table or heat their home. So I know that this government, under the leadership of our Premier Ford, will continue to hold the federal Liberals accountable when it comes to this terrible tax, but we are the only ones in this legislature, it seems, who are willing to stand up for the hardworking folks in our ridings and demand accountability from the federal Liberals. So, Speaker, could the minister please explain once again to this chamber what our government is doing to fight Question. this job-killing tax and support the people of our province? The Minister of Energy. Speaker, we continue to fight the federal carbon tax, which is driving up the price of everything in our province, Mr. Speaker, fully supported by the Ontario Liberal leader, the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie. Now, we have a powering Ontario's growth plan that we released last summer, and you know the proof is in the pudding, Mr. Speaker. Last week, I was at a great announcement in Cambridge at BWXT. I know Premier Ford was there as well later in the day. An $80 million expansion at the BWXT plant, creating over 200 jobs, Mr. Speaker, all part of our clean, non-emitting nuclear investments that we're making in the small modular reactors at Darlington and the refurbishment of the large reactors at Bruce and at Pickering and at Darlington. And uh, don't forget about the new 4.8 gigawatts that we're investing in large nuclear at Bruce, Mr. Speaker. That's a huge announcement that is going to Bots. ensure we have clean, non-emitting, reliable and affordable energy for decades to come. We don't need this punitive carbon tax in Ontario. 
The next question. The member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And this question is for the Premier. When the government takes one step forward and two steps back, it's the rest of us who have to bear the consequences. This government has wasted hours in this House pushing through unfair and undemocratic legislation, only to spend hours reversing those decisions because of public pressure. Now we're learning, despite the reversal, of the decision to break up Peel Region, the provincially appointed board is costing taxpayers $1.5 million. Why are Peel taxpayers stuck with a bill for $1.5 million over this government's flip-flops? And to respond, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, actually just the opposite. Uh, uh, what we're doing, uh, of course, uh, the parliamentary assistant is leading a regional governance uh, uh, review across uh, our fastest growing regions. The goal of uh, not only uh, uh, the Peel transition, but the regional governance review is to ensure that we can build the infrastructure that is needed to get shovels in the ground. That is what we're hearing from our partners uh, uh, across municipalities, not only in, in, uh, in Peel and in the, in the fastest growing regions of the province, but all over the province. And that is precisely why the Minister of Infrastructure, supported by uh, this caucus and the Minister of Finance, brought forward uh, a groundbreaking, frankly, no pun intended, but $1.8 billion program to build infrastructure. The work of the Transition Committee is to help us unleash that even further, not only in Peel, Mr. Speaker, but in other areas of the province. I look forward Response. to the work they're doing, but more importantly, Mr. Speaker, we look forward to the opportunities to continue to build infrastructure so that we get more homes built across the province. The supplementary question. Thank you. Municipal leaders are so fed up, Speaker. The uncertainty is causing taxpayers millions of dollars, and the region is no better off than they were months ago. All this government has done is create instability and line the pockets of the transition board handpicked by this Premier. The board charged taxpayers $858,000 for six months' work between July and December of last year, and then they charged $635,000 for work for three months between January and March 5th. This is good work, I guess, if you can get it. It is unclear who is getting paid, for what, and how much. Can the Premier clarify what the people are paying $1.5 million for? Yeah. <laughs> Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what municipal leader she's talking to because the ones that I've been talking to, I know that the Premier was just at the Ontario Big City Mayor's uh, Conference on the weekend, and he was resoundingly uh, congratulated for the work to get more shovels in the ground for the $1.8 billion worth of infrastructure investments that we're making. Speaker. We've heard that everywhere that we have gone. We've heard the exact same message that this government is finally listening after 15 long, dark years under the previous Liberal government supported by the NDP. This government understands that the best way to support our municipalities is to let them do the jobs that they were elected to do. And what they have said to us overwhelmingly, and I'm sure the Premier understood this message, as did the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Infrastructure. Get more shovels in the ground by building sewer and water capacity. Build communities by bringing them schools, transit and transportation. And that is what we are doing across the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Spons. And that is why there are more Conservatives representing more municipalities across the province of Ontario than at any other time in the province's history, and why that party continues to shrink to irrelevance. The next question, the member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. The, car the federal carbon tax is creating financial pressure for Ontario families who are being forced to pay more for the everyday essentials. Speaker, small and medium-sized businesses in Ajax tell me that they are concerned about rising energy bills and fuel costs. Business owners are seeing soaring expenses affect their bottom line, threatening their livelihood and that of their employees. Speaker, this really must come to an end. While the, ta the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, stands with her federal buddies, our government will always support hardworking people of this province. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is helping Canadians, Ontarians, cope with rising costs driven by the carbon tax? Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, for, from Ajax for that question. You may know things are hard for the people of Ontario right now, high interest rates and high inflation 
are driving up the cost of food, driving up the cost of gas. Even the Bank of Canada has said the carbon tax drives up inflation, yet somehow the Liberals continue to support it. Mr. Speaker, governments should be working together to drive down the cost for Ontario families. That's why our government is keeping costs down by extending our gas tax cut until the end of the year and helping Ontario families save hundreds of dollars. But, Mr. Speaker, we need the federal government to do their part. I'll renew another call I've made before, the Premier's made before, all of us have made before, Mr. Speaker, Spons. to the federal government. Join us in driving down the cost of living and ending the carbon tax once and for all. And this supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. The federal Liberals are fueling the affordability crisis with their tax hikes. Yeah. And to make matters worse, rather than standing up for their constituents, the provincial counterparts are supporting this price gouging federal carbon tax. Shame. This is unacceptable, Speaker. Our government must continue to keep costs down for families and businesses while calling for an end to this costly tax. Just a few weeks ago, the minister delivered a budget that, that is continuing our plan to build a better Ontario while ensuring people keep money in their pockets. Sure. Speaker, back to the minister. If the Ontario Liberals won't help and the federal Liberals won't listen, what is our government doing to build a better future for Ontarians and our province economy? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Ajax, my neighbour, and the great job you do for the constituents of Ajax. It's very simple, Mr. Speaker. You cannot tax your way to prosperity. There are two types of governments. There are the ones that raise taxes and add tolls and increase the cost of living. And there are the ones that cut costs, ban tolls, and put money back in the hard-working pockets of the people of Ontario. And, Mr. Speaker, under this Premier, I am more than proud to be part of the second group. In our budget, we delivered historic new cost-saving measures and are providing billions in savings across the province. But, Mr. Speaker, politics is a team sport. We are seeing the price of gas spike across the province, and we all know why. So to the federal Liberals, to the queen of the carbon tax for that party over there, response. join us in making life more affordable for Ontarians and finally scrap the carbon tax. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. Bishop Brigante, a local hip-hop artist and actor, is fighting stage four colorectal cancer. He's 45 years old and was diagnosed last fall. Bishop had symptoms earlier yet they were dismissed. He has started a petition with over 30,000 signatures from people who, like him, are demanding this government lower the current colonoscopy colorectal screening age criteria of 50. The Minister of Health has indicated that their colon cancer check program is actively monitoring colorectal cancer and will evaluate program recommendations such as screening age criteria based on new and emerging data. My question, Speaker, is to the Premier. Can the government explain to Bishop and other late-stage metastasized colon cancer patients in their 20s, 30s, and 40s what new and emerging data is this government waiting for? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, we will continue to rely on clinical advice, clinical feedback to ensure that we have the best cancer screening in the province of Ontario. And, you know, I have to say that while it is very disturbing when we hear examples of individuals who are dealing with a colon cancer treatment and diagnosis early in their stages, we have some of the exceptional, most exceptional clinicians in the province of Ontario. Yes, we will continue to monitor using the, the experts at Colon Cancer Ontario and Cancer Care Ontario to ensure that as emerging evidence comes forward that it is the most appropriate pathway for diagnosis and treatment, we will be there as we were when we announced last year and a decrease in when access for um, breast cancer was uh, announced and will start in September of this year. Thank you, Speaker. And the supplementary question. 
Uh, speaker, the experts at Colorectal Cancer Canada, Canadian Cancer Society, and Sunnybrook Health Science Centre's Young Adult Colorectal Cancer Clinic have noted the rise in people under 50 with colorectal cancer. Colorectal Cancer Canada says diagnoses, quote, rapidly climbed in recent years and referred to it in a recent news story as a quote-unquote alarming reality. And many would add that this rise is especially acute for racialized Indigenous Black people of colour, but this government does not collect race-based data. We've asked for this many, many, many years. My question is back to the Premier. Can this government share with all Ontarians, including BIPOC Ontarians, in their 20s, 30s and 40s fighting colorectal cancer if they are prepared to lower the age criteria for a colonoscopy? And if not, what is their provincial plan for early detection to help save lives like Bishop and countless others? Thank you. Members, please take their seats. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I'm not sure if Thank you, Speaker. I'm not sure if the member opposite is suggesting that the $2 billion that we fund Cancer Care Ontario to allow hospitals across Ontario to provide exceptional cancer treatment is not what she thinks is appropriate. I believe that we must continue to rely on clinicians, to rely on expert data to drive our decisions. I will not put the risk of people of Ontario into um, suggesting that these are political decisions. They must be made by experts, by our specialists, by our clinicians working in the field. I will continue to rely on their expertise because, frankly, our numbers show that we are doing an excellent job in Ontario, including, of course, making changes that Spons. increase access to cancer treatment in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, last week, I sent the Premier a can of gravy to symbolize the runaway gravy train chugga, that is chugga, his chugga, office, chugga, 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 more than doubling chugga, chugga, his chugga, chugga, budget to 6.9 million, million, going from 20 to 48 people on the Sunshine List. Now, Speaker, the average salary of the Premier's Sunshine staff is twice that of the median family income on Ontario. Speaker, not an individual family income. And for those families, life is more expensive than under any other Premier in Ontario's history. So, Speaker, how is the Premier's runaway gravy train helping Ontario families at all? To reply, the Premier. Well, M Mr. Speaker, it's very hard to take the member serious. This is the person that invented the gravy train. His government ran the gravy train right into the ground, losing 300,000 jobs from this province. Talk to the 300,000 people that don't have a paycheck because of his government supported by the NDP. Talk about what we're doing today. Over 700,000 more people are bringing home a paycheck because of our policies. We're building new hospitals in this province. We're building new long-term care. We're building the largest subway expansion in North America. We're building roads and highways and bridges. Our economy right now is one of the strongest in North America, one of the strongest in the world. We've become an economic powerhouse. No matter if it's the EV, uh, EV vehicles or the EV uh, uh, batteries, I should say, or being number one in the world when it comes to having six of the largest auto manufacturers right here. That's what we're Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Peter, for that answer. So, but I hear there's rumors of a shuffle because apparently some cabinet ministers are applying for jobs in the Premier's office. Pays better. The bonus is the Order. bonus is they get to tell other ministers what to say and what to do every day. So the truth is, the Premier's gravy train is leaving Ontario families behind. Every day, more and more families are forced to use their credit card instead of their OHIP card. Rent is skyrocketing because there's no real rent control. Small landlords are being bankrupted by delays that the landlord can't afford. And now we hear, and now we hear, that the Premier wants to start charging people for testing their well water. So, Shame. Speaker, Shame. when will the Premier and his office? Stop the gravy train and stop leaving Ontario families behind. 
Order. And the Premier. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, there's been no government that's taken more money out of people's pockets than the government you were under. There's no leader in this province that wants to charge people more on the Order. carbon tax than the queen Order. of carbon tax. The one who came up with a carbon tax wants Order. to make sure we keep it, wants to come back with a cap and trade, increase gas prices by 19 and a half, 19 and a half cents per Order. litre. Ottawa, so you know, Mr. Speaker, the gravy train was going full steam under this government. Mr. Speaker, we're the only government, think of this, we're the only government Order. that has never raised a tax. We reduced taxes. We got rid of the license registration. We cut tolls on the 412 and 418. We reduced the gas Response. price by 10.7 cents a litre. We're going to continue putting money back into people's pockets. Yeah. Unlike the Liberals and NDP, they know one thing, tax and spend. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. At a time when families across Ontario struggle to cover their basic living expenses, the federal carbon tax is an additional burden to their already stretched budgets. Despite the hardship people in Ontario are going through, the Liberals, led by the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, and the opposition NDP want to triple this tax by 2030. Speaker, Ontario need urgent relief from the negative impacts of this devastating tax. And despite the Liberals' persistent advocacy for higher taxes, our government understands the need to alleviate financial pressure and deliver real affordability for the people of this province. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House what actions our government is taking to combat the carbon tax? To reply, the Minister of Energy. To the member from Thornhill, as a matter of fact, we've done a lot. We've reduced the gas tax until the end of the year. We brought in One Fair, the great minister of One Fair with great hair. He introduced that earlier this year, saving those who take transit $1,600 a year, Mr. Speaker. We have never raised a tax, as the Premier just said, or a fee, Mr. Speaker. Now, you've got the Liberals over here, led by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, who are in full support of the federal carbon tax. That you know, this is like deja vu all over again, Mr. Speaker. I remember standing in this House as an opposition member when those Liberals brought in the Green Energy Act, and all we saw were taillights headed for the U.S., Mr. Speaker, as 300,000 jobs left for the southern part of the United States. Now, they're doing it again at the federal level, level Mr. Speaker, with the Fonts. carbon tax. They're doing their best to stop the work that's happening in here, those 700,000 new jobs that have come to Ontario since Premier Ford and our government have taken office. We're on the right tack. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response and his dedicated work within his portfolio. So, on April 1st, the federal Liberals, uh, alongside their NDP allies, enacted a staggering 23% carbon tax. That's crazy. The, this is unacceptable, Speaker. This tax hike inflicts further harm on families across Ontario, forcing an additional 17.6 cents per litre to their gas bills. It's not surprising that Ontarians across this province oppose this unjust measure. But it's unfortunate that the Liberal and the NDP members in this House care more about playing politics than advocating on behalf of the people that they represent. Speakers, Ontarians need relief. The federal government needs to abolish the carbon tax now. Speaker, could the minister please elaborate on how this recent tax hike imposed by the Liberals is adversely affecting Ontarians? Again, the Minister of Energy. Well, Speaker, just like the Green Energy Act did with the Liberals previous, the federal carbon tax is driving people into energy poverty. And we just heard the Minister of Finance talking about the impact that it's having, and the Bank of Canada affirms everything, and the Environmental Commissioner 
in Ottawa has also said that the federal Liberals' plan, supported by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, isn't working. That's why we've released a different plan, Mr. Speaker. It's called Powering Ontario's Growth, and we're seeing the results. We're reducing emissions from our energy sector. I mentioned last week I was down in Niagara Falls for that massive refurbishment announcement. We have massive refurbishments going on at our Candu nuclear facilities at Darlington and also at Bruce and about to get underway at Pickering, Mr. Speaker. That's going to ensure affordable, safe, reliable energy for the next 30 to 40 years, Mr. Speaker. And as a result of those investments, including the small modular reactors we're building at Darlington, last Friday I was with the MPPs Rydell and Dixon in Cambridge, and we saw an $80 million expansion at BWXT, 250 new jobs. That's on top of all of the jobs that these refurbishments are creating. We have a plan for Ontario. It's working, and it doesn't include a carbon tax. Thank you very much. And the next question, the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier. Today is Earth Day. The Premier's Bill 165 will increase people's Enbridge bills and force them to finance expansion of the gas system. That will mean people will be poorer and the world's climate will get hotter. This Earth Day, will the Premier abandon Bill 165 in order to protect people's pocketbooks and avoid climate disasters? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I just uh, I answered a question about all of the things that our government is doing to ensure that we have clean, reliable, safe affordable energy for our province going forward. That includes multi-billion dollar refurbishments that are happening at Bruce and OPG's Darlington Station, multi-billion dollar investments at Pickering, something that that member is opposed to, Mr. Speaker. He's opposed to the 76,000 jobs in our nuclear sector and the baseload power that comes from those facilities, Mr. Speaker, providing up to 60 percent of our power every day. We rely on natural gas in our province, Mr. Speaker. Over 70 per cent of homes, you know what they're heated by? Natural gas, Mr. Speaker, something that member would pull out of people's homes tomorrow if he had the chance. We're going to ensure through Bill 165 that we keep energy costs affordable, and we're going to keep all of the new Response. homes that we're building in Ontario affordable as well, something that the NDP is opposed to, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Premier, your actions to increase gas burning in homes and in the electricity system will mean higher bills for everyone. Your actions make it impossible to meet even your inadequate plans for reducing carbon pollution. We all know that rising costs and rising temperatures will make life much harder for people. Again, this Earth Day, will the Premier abandon Bill 165 and protect people's pocketbooks and futures instead of Enbridge's profits. Members will take their seats. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, it's absolutely ludicrous to have the NDP standing up and talking about affordable energy, Mr. Speaker. Nobody in this country believes it. The NDP are supporting uh, Prime Minister Trudeau on the federal carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. They're going to do it again when they uh, reinforce or vote in favour of the budget in a couple of weeks' time on Parliament Hill. That's driving people into energy poverty. They supported the Green Energy Act, Mr. Speaker, that the previous provincial Liberals bought, brought forward. And we know how the current Liberal leader, the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, feels about the federal carbon tax. It's driving people into energy poverty as well, Mr. Speaker. Our Powering Ontario's Growth Plan will ensure that we have non-emitting baseload power going forward that our province can count on to see the type of investments that we have been seeing under the leadership of Premier Ford and our Minister of Economic Spons. Development, uh, Minister Fidelli, out there feeding the bushes and bringing back billions of dollars of investments into our EV, EV battery, and, uh, and our manufacturing jobs back to this province, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atticokin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. The Liberal carbon tax hurts Ontario farmers and limits their potential to grow our agricultural and food industry. Since the implementation of this punitive tax in 2019, our farmers have seen production costs increase exponentially. Speaker, people in my riding at Thunder Bay, Atacokan and all across the province rely on Ontario farmers to grow high-quality, healthy food for their families. 
It's not fair that the federal Liberals are continuing to punish farmers who already utilize environmentally responsible practices with a tax that does absolutely nothing to reduce emissions. They need to scrap the tax now. Speaker, can the minister please share what she has heard directly from Ontario farmers about the impact of the carbon tax on their businesses? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise in the House today and first and foremost acknowledge the great member from Thunder Bay, Anna Koken, who's doing a beautiful job advocating for his riding as well as all of Northern Ontario. And you know what? We're meeting with farmers every day. And just a couple of weeks ago, Drew Spolstra, president of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, joined the Premier and myself and the president of the Treasury Board at a rally in Holland Marsh. And Drew spoke to people and shared that he dried 2,200 tons of grain last fall, and it cost him $4,500 in carbon tax alone. Wow. And that was before the 23% wow. increase that we realized as of April 1st. Drew explained that the carbon tax makes Ontario farmers less competitive against imports, and it also makes Ontario products less competitive around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Beef Farmers of Ontario are in the House today, and the chair of BFO shared earlier this morning that 40 per cent of all beef produced in Ontario is exported. So for goodness sakes, we need to be doing Bons. everything we can to make sure that Ontario farmers are competitive, not only in Ontario and North America, but around the world. The queen of the carbon tax needs to jam on the brakes of that minivan and Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. I know my constituents will be pleased to hear that, unlike the federal Liberals, liberals and the provincial, their provincial buddies, our, local, our government is actually listening to farmers in Ontario. The carbon tax harms hardworking individuals, businesses, and farmers. But, Speaker, the Prime Minister keeps saying that farmers are exempted from the carbon tax. As we just heard from the Minister, that is not the case. Ontarians won't be fooled by the Liberals' money-grabbing schemes and their carbon tax. Speaker, can the Minister please explain how the federal carbon tax is negatively impacting Ontario's farmers? Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you, Speaker. And you know, we need to get something straight here in the House today. There's been a lot of rhetoric that farmers are exempted, but the fact of the matter is the only thing exempted on an Ontario farm today is the diesel used in tractors, colored fuel. And the fact of the matter is we need propane. We need natural gas on our farms to heat our barns and to also dry down our crops in the fall. And you know, greenhouses are really hitting getting hit hard. Drew, the president of OFA also explained that one greenhouse relied on natural gas. Their total energy bill of $13,614 included nearly $4,000 in carbon tax alone. And again, that was before the April 1st increase. Ladies and gentlemen, there's one way that we can stand by farmers in Ontario, and it's by joining together and telling the, of the carbon tax to get there, to there. Ottawa and tell those federal Liberals once and for all to scrap the tax. The member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Employment service providers help job seekers find meaningful, long-term careers, helping people break the cycle of poverty and homelessness. Employment services funding has been stagnant for well over a decade. Why? Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. I you know, Speaker, that's just categorically not true, Speaker. We've increased employment services of funding when we led employment service transformation across Ontario. But, Speaker, to look at that in isolation would be doing a disservice, a disservice to the thousands hundreds of thousands of I'm going to ask the minister to withdraw the unparliamentary comment withdraw 
this service to the hundreds of thousands of men and women trained through the Skills Development Fund for better jobs with a bigger paycheck. Speaker, We've been helping racialize, marginalized, socioeconomically disadvantaged groups all across Ontario have access to a meaningful job. Speaker, and I visited the justice-affected individuals, Oaks Revitalization Centre. I'm meeting with them, I think it's this week or next, Speaker, to talk firsthand with men Spots. and women, literally, Speaker, who've had run-ins with justice. But today, thanks to this Premier, this government, our tax-paying members of society working on the front lines of skilled trades. Supplementary question. Perhaps a minister should talk to the providers and read the notes that they prepared, not the notes that the government prepares for them. The numbers speak for themselves. When people have help finding good, stable jobs, it represents savings for the province and happy, productive lives. Yet ESPs are now being forced to take over Ontario Works responsibilities on top of their core mandate to help people find work. Why do Conservatives always expect hardworking people on the front line to do more with less? Mr. Labour. Again, uh, Speaker, the only uh, people in this House that want uh, these men and women to do more with less is the NDP because they voted every time against budget measures that have put more funding into programs like Skills Development Fund. I would encourage that member to join me in the union trading halls in his own riding, look them in the face and explain to those business reps why he voted against SDF funding that's helping Order. people who are out of work get access to a job. It's because he doesn't want to build the hospitals. He doesn't want to build the schools. He wants misery. Order. He wants government handouts. He doesn't want to give these people a leg up. That's what we're doing with this government speaker. We're giving people dignity and purpose, and I'm proud of it. Order. The next question, the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. It's no secret that Ontarians are fed up with the Liberal carbon tax. It's driving up the cost of living and forcing Ontarians to pay more at the gas pumps. But, Speaker, people in my riding are concerned about the impact of this regressive tax on our public safety system. They know that the Liberal carbon tax is draining resources that should be better spent on protecting their communities. Our first responders deserve support and resources to keep people safe instead of paying for additional fuel costs because of the carbon tax. Sure. Speaker, can the Solicitor General explain the effects of the carbon tax is having on law enforcement in Ontario? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my friend for that serious question. And I've said this before, the unnecessary carbon tax has an impact on public safety. When police services, when animal welfare departments, when other departments within governments and across Ontario have to spend money for the carbon tax, it means that they are diverting resources that they could use to keep our community safe. Mr. Speaker, let me be specific about our great firefighters. These are amazing people. All we ask of them is that they come home safe at the end of the day to their families. The 21 cents a litre for diesel is affecting every fill-up. It means that $60 for fill-up on a fire truck, on average, is just for the carbon tax. On average, $8,000 a year. Do the math all across Ontario. Response. Bonnie Crombie was the mayor of Mississauga. She knew the fire budget, the fire department budget in Mississauga. She should do the right thing and be honest to Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. It's disheartening to hear how the carbon tax puts a strain on our public safety system. Ever since the carbon tax came into effect in 2019, it has increased the cost of the very institutions that help keep Ontarians safe. Speaker, our government has promised to protect what matters most, and few things matter more than the security of our communities. We want our police firefighters, paramedics, corrections officers, and our frontline responders to be able to continue providing the potentially life-saving services we rely on. That's why we will continue to fight the federal carbon tax. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain what our government is doing to fight increased costs to community safety services caused by the imp imp imposition of a burdensome federal carbon tax? Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and our goal has been clear, to keep Ontario safe. 
But, Mr. Speaker, it means that the resources need to be provided to the police services, as example, across Ontario. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it means that $4 million plus of the OPP budget is being used to pay the carbon tax. That's it is so simple to understand. And Mr. Speaker, I said this last week, Bonnie Crombie sat on police on the Peel Police Service Board. She knew the numbers. It's a fact that Peel Police has to pay the carbon tax on their vehicles, just like everywhere in Ontario. Let her come clean and say she knows this, and she'll call her friend Justin and Jagmeet and say this is punitive to public safety. Cancel that tax. Here, here. The next question is the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Despite recent assurance that there has been no changes to water testing, communities like Niagara depend heavily on the Public Health Ontario free drinking water testing. They need to know the minister is committed to keeping those labs open. Last Friday, the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority urged and reconsideration of the plan to close the labs and essential services. They pointed to Niagara's high instances of bacterial contamination, a revelation only made available because of the PHO's free water testing program. Can the minister explain why the discontinuation is still under consideration when so many experts are telling you it's a big mistake? Minister of Health. Okay, Speaker, this is going to be the third time. To be clear, there are no changes Lower. where the people of Ontario Lower. can get their well water tested for free Order. in the province of Ontario. I grew up on well water. I know how important it is. There are many people in this, in this uh, chamber who understand the value and importance of why and when we test public well water in the province of Ontario. You know, I, uh, I want to remind the member opposite that this was actually a report that came out from an independent officer of the, the Assembly, Auditor the Auditor General. And the last time I checked, the Auditor General does not impose and set policy on the people of Ontario. We do that as a government. We have been very clear there are no changes in anticipated in well water testing. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The Niagara Peninsula SPC expressed significant concern that discontinuing PHO's free drinking water testing program will negatively impact Ontario residents. In fact, their request to keep the lab open and maintain government's responsibility for essential services is more than advice from the experts. Its recommendation that was made by the Walkerton inquiry. Given your previous assurance that no changes have been made to the water testing program, can you clarify why the government is not completely committed to keeping these labs open, ensuring the health and water quality for our families and children across Ontario remain safe? Minister of Health. Okay, Speaker, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to draw a picture here. So the Auditor General makes a recommendation. Order. That recommendation is assessed, reviewed. Public Health Ontario looks at it. Public Health Ontario, perhaps, perhaps not, makes a recommendation to the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health makes a recommendation, makes an assessment, and decides to proceed or not proceed. There has been no recommendation from public health to the Ministry of Health. I don't know how much clearer Order. I can be. When we do not have a review ongoing, I am not going to tell the member opposite that we are going to do or not do. We will continue to test the well water in the province of Ontario. We've had it Response. for decades. Order. I grew up with it. It is a system that many of us understand the value and importance of in rural Ontario because we lived it every single day. We're going to continue that process. 
The next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. Ontario's vibrant tourism and hospitality sector is one of the cornerstones of my local community and our economy, contributing billions of dollars in revenue and sustaining countless jobs right across Ontario. However, the prosperity of this critical industry is being threatened by the Liberal carbon tax. From skyrocketing fuel costs for transportation to soaring energy bills for hotels and restaurants, this dreaded tax is imposing severe financial strain on small businesses right across our province. Speaker, that's not fair. Our government will continue to support Ontario's small business and ensure their concerns are heard. Speaker, through you, can the minister tell the House the devastating consequences that this regressive tax is having on Ontario's tourism and hospitality operators? The parliamentary assistant. Well, thank you, Speaker. Thank you for my colleague. Thank you to my colleague for the excellent question. Our government recognized the profound importance of Ontario's tourism and hospitality sector, which showcased the best of our province to visitors from around the world. In 2022, Ontario welcomed over half of all international visits to Canada, generating $38 billion of tourism revenue. Unfortunately, the opposition seems content to sit idly by while their uh, tax-friendly allies in Ottawa strangle small businesses in this industry with the suffocating carbon tax. Why would they do that? From uh, picturesque bed and breakfasts in rural communities to Response. iconic restaurants in our urban centres, these small businesses are being crushed under the weight of exorbitant costs, especially with summer around the corner. Exhalated, uh, ex Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes our question period for this morning. Pursuant to standing order.